I'm Albert. Prior to uh, Star Rocks, I used to work for uh, MongoDB. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what user facing analytics is, a little bit about the challenges, and talk a little bit about case studies. Uh, if I only had 30 seconds of your time, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the nut of it, right? The nut of it is user facing analytics is this idea of giving basically access to your OLAP environment and, and creating citizen scientists. You don't need IT people in order for you to go and be able to do ad hoc queries or any type of queries against petabytes of information at subsocket response time. That's one. Uh, second thing is uh, talk a little bit about Star Rocks. So Star Rocks itself, uh, you can access it uh, just by using MySQL protocol. And we're essentially a open source version of Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift. All right, so uh, let's do the rest of the presentation. I'll get to more of the details from that standpoint. So uh, I talked a little bit about user-facing analytics, right? So what is it from that standpoint? It is this idea of empowering users to explore data themselves without the need for technical expertise, right? And this idea of creating citizen scientists or, or giving people with like, you know, access directly to the data themselves, they can go and help themselves from that standpoint. And so this is what we talk about is self-service analytics, being able to do uh, their own embedding into other systems, into other dashboards, we also talk about things about augmented uh, analytics and conversational analytics, being able to be, you know, uh, adding uh, to the user experience in other different ways, just purely than, than just querying the data itself, empowering other systems, AI, ML, or even uh, user-facing systems that uh, might be exposed to you. Like, for instance, uh, VR use cases and other augmented uh, use cases. So uh, what is the biggest problem with user-facing analytics? So it's great. You talk about, OK, Albert, you can go and do petabytes information of subsequent response plans. But why is it that current systems can't do this, right? So the biggest, one of the biggest issues is ingestion speed and data updates, right? So if you're talking about is a lot of the real-time streaming systems or even large batch systems, it takes a while for them to ingest. Like you'll typically see things in uh, double digit second times in minutes, uh, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes for them, then you can go query, uh, query data, right? So the goal for the new generation of OLAP systems is single digit seconds, right? So once that data comes on in from say, for instance, Kafka or some other streaming service or from Airbyte or whatnot, it's ingested by OLAP system and within nine seconds, you can start querying the data live for other systems uh, or for other queries from that standpoint. Uh, the other thing too is being able to make is uh, this idea of mutable data, right? So a lot of the older OLAP systems are uh, essentially append only, right? Read only. Uh, and the idea here is that if you're not familiar with that concept is that it's kind of like a checkbook ledger, right? You add $20, add $40, minus $30, and you got this kind of, you know, yeah, uh, sequence of events over time, and that's how you actually go and manage the data. Now, a lot of people uh, from that standpoint is they want to make changes, it's, it becomes difficult. So they want to be able to do upserts, they want to be able to do deletes, they want to be able to go and modify the data, fix data as they see, right? That's one. Uh, big thing also is query times. So uh, obviously, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about the use cases. But if we're not de uh, if we're not delivering subsecond response times on petabytes of data, star star star, right? Uh, it, it's really not uh, what we think about as real time analytics. Now, uh, I I caveat that because a lot of people ask me the question about well, what is really real time from that standpoint? Real time to me is that it's fresh within ten minutes fresh within five minutes, right? But you think about some of the user-facing or real-time analytics use cases that we see in the marketplace, that's for FinTech, or that is for things like uh, decision uh, uh, support decision services like uh, ad bidding or whatnot, right? Those type of situations where you need to make decisions within seconds, single digit seconds of whether you're going to buy, no buy, do, no do from that standpoint. That's the kind of responses that we want to be able to do. Look at his, large amounts of historical data, 
and be able to look at real-time data and merge those two things and make present that data to the end user so that they can make those decisions, right? Uh, other things is about scalability. Uh, there's always challenges with scalability. Everybody wants is essentially is a linear uh, growth model in terms of scalability, meaning that if I add systems over time, I'm not going to get to a point where, you know, I'm just throwing more servers and I'm not going to get uh, get linear performance, right? And uh, as you can imagine, when your data size gets bigger and bigger, the idea is that it's going to cost more and more, more VMs, more storage, more everything in order for me to go support that, right? Uh, so how do we fix that type of issue so we can get linear type of scalability with the solution? And obviously, it's cost, right? Uh, a lot of the uh, OLAP systems that are out in the marketplace, they're either bounded by memory or bounded by VM or I.O., and uh, in certain situations, depending on which cloud provider you have or even on-prem systems, the, the way they, they make it is that, oh, the mem high memory instances are much, much more expensive. So how do we go and make some of those cost savings, right? So what does Ro Star Rocks do in order for us to solve this type of problem, right? So uh, we at Star Rocks think of ourselves as an open source query engine that delivers data warehouse performance on the data lake, right? Um, now, what does that really mean, right? So the idea here is that whether you have is data in S3 buckets or data that you store on local disk, right? We want to be able to get data warehouse performance, right? Usually the, the the idea here is that if it's on S3, it's going to be a lot slower. Actually, our own performance test is that the, the difference between, say, for instance, AWS, EBS uh, data storage versus S3, there's about a 5 to 10% performance degradation, right? But if you can absorb that 10% difference, right, you get... 80%, 90, 95% cost savings in terms of storage, right? So the thing is, is that, are you willing to go and do this? And there's ways to go and negate even the, 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 you know, the difference between local storage versus remote storage or EBS, SanDisk storage versus uh, S3 storage. There's other ways for us to even get better, better near, near performance. But if you can absorb that, it is a, it is a huge cost saving structure, right? Uh, the other thing that uh, people want is this idea of subsecond joins and aggregations on billions and billions of rows, right? So this idea that says, you know, uh, if you read stuff like Phoenix Project, I want it to be cheaper. I, I want, how do you get velocity, right? How do you get more business value, right? So there's only several things in the book. If you've never read it, it's a really popular book off of any single, like on Amazon, it's usually been for, for the last couple of years, number one in terms of uh, IT books to go read. So it says things like, the only way you can get faster is either reduce scope, eliminate steps or automate, right? And the thing is, is that we've gotten to this point where, you know, uh, denormalization was a concept that was introduced in the, in the 1990s. And this is the only way for us to get performance, right? We denormalize everything. And basically, we push all the work into pipeline and data engineering, right? And the question is, the, if you ask new data engineers that get into the market, they're like, why? Why do we do this? And then we're the old guys like me that's been, you know, doing this for 20 some years, like, well, that's how we've always done it because we couldn't get the performance we needed. So we had to go and do this thing. And they're like, well, well, but technology has changed, right? Technology has gotten better, right? And so the thing is, is that we can now do subsecond joins from that standpoint. And that, if you can go do that, we reduce the amount of infrastructure that's needed for the data pipeline, the amount of data engineering that needs to be built, all that, a lot of it gets simplified and and, and uh, reduced from the for, or maybe even eliminated from that standpoint. And then, then we're able to go and do uh, uh, you know get more uh, value out of the infrastructure, right? Uh, the other thing is a uh, concurrency. Uh, this is a sore point for a lot of the uh, users of uh, public cloud. Uh, a lot of times you guys top out at uh, 50 or 100. You guys know it, right? You guys feel it every single day if you use one of the, the major public cloud vendors uh, in terms of concurrent uh, uh, queries from that standpoint. And the other thing, too, is being able to support is ease of migration, right? At the very end of the day is that 
every single database vendor, just like, or every database project, just like us, just like everybody else, if we are not coming out with a solution that's cheaper, faster, better, right? And looking at the marketplace and what are the current solutions in the marketplace and even the newer stuff that comes out, if we're not cheaper, faster, better on every single one of those features, I mean, there's no reason why you would ever even launch an open source project, right? And so we think we have, we think we have one of the best sets in the marketplace. Right. So uh, the question is, you know, how do we get is some of the uh, low latency queries from that standpoint? So uh, what's not talked about a lot is uh, SIMD, uh, single instruction multi-data. So it was in academics papers uh, before. And essentially, uh, there's only a few databases in the market that actually has large amounts of SIMD code. And so the idea here, SIMD is single instruction, multiple data. The idea here is that I can apply is one operation, a vectorized operation that allows me to go and do multiple reads at the same time, multiple writes at the same time. And so that for one CPU clock cycle, I can do more than just saying a single operation you know, read or write from that, that point of view. Now, there is a lot of other things that we go do in order to make uh, queries a lot faster. Uh, these are things around is join reordering algorithms. These are things around how we do push down predicates, how we do filtering. Uh, I have a huge white paper that uh, I've I've written uh, with me and the rest of the, the engineering team off of Starrocks.io, you can look more to, to figure out a little bit more uh, or to learn about more uh, later, right? So what are other things that we're we're trying to work on too? So the thing is, is that we also have is IO bound and CPU bound uh, workloads, right? So how do we solve uh, these uh, uh, different areas? And a lot of these answers are not unique to ourselves, right? These are things that other vendors have done bucketing, indexing, better partitioning, right? Uh, better caching from that standpoint. In fact, we have is several different levels of cache. We have block caching, we have query, query caching. We also do is the ability for you to have uh, uh, materialized views. And you can actually build a materialized view across Apache hoodie and a patch across Hive and uh, across uh, Apache Iceberg. You can have a materialized view across all three if you wanted to uh, within our solution itself. And rollups and and sync, async, you know, all the typical things that you would, you know, reasonably expect from any type of OLAP vendor in the marketplace. All right. Uh, I talked a little bit about is the problem with mutable data, right? So uh, a lot of people go and do merge on read, right? Uh, we actually uh, don't do that. We do a more simplistic way, which is delete and insert. Uh, and this is very, very efficient for read heavy workloads, right? So most of, I would say that uh, there are other companies uh, that do merge on read, right? Uh, and uh, even uh, other open table formats that, that do merge on read. So I'm not knocking it. It's just that there's you know, pros and cons, we optimize for the use case of read heavy workloads, right? And using, uh, we have three different tables within Star Rocks. We have a primary key table that allows you to kind of use it like an OLTP, star, 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 star. We have an aggregate key table and we have is a duplicate key table. But if you use the primary key table, that's where you can go. And since we have essentially as a primary key, that's why you can go and do deletes, upserts and whatnot. Uh, at um, you know, at different parts of the of the data store, right? Uh, another thing that we do in order for us to scale with solutions is that we put in a priority based resource isolation. So this allows you to get away from the idea of like over provisioning systems, right? And paying for for software that you don't necessarily or resources though that you don't necessarily do, right? So one of the things is like we have is short query. Uh, these are ones that, you know, are time sensitive. We can go and push them up to the top of the priority queue, right? Uh, and then we have is other types of queries that maybe are not time sensitive, but are critical. So this idea of prioritization of your queries allow you to make sure that even given that maybe a constrained resource issue, you're able to go and, and you know, get your most reported queries executed over all the other queries that, that need to be run on the system itself. 
All right. Um, so I already talked a, a lot about is is this. So I just wanted to add some other things uh, that that I didn't go say about some of the differentiators that you have to have in order for you to have uh, user facing analytics, right? So I think one of the big things is integration to open data lakes, right? So. Uh, you know, in the marketplace, you're seeing that uh, the idea that uh, local storage attached with a compute node is just not the model that is being done anymore, right? So everybody's moving towards this idea of separation of compute and storage, right? And with that separation of compute and storage, the idea here is why does storage have to be proprietary? Meaning that why does this has to be a product vendor format inside of S3? Why can't we use something like an open table format, like Apache Hoodie and Iceberg or Delta Lake or Hive or whatnot, right? And so the thing is, is that uh, Starbucks is a big proponent of that. We support is uh, those uh, uh, four. We actually support more like uh, Apache Pymon, uh, and others, but I would say those those four that I, I just previously mentioned are the ones that we support the most from that standpoint. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about a use case that's actually in petabyte range that that uses this type of architecture um, to get uh, speed uh, speedy queries from it, right? Uh, I already talked a little bit about a lot of the the various uh, things uh, that we have that uh, that maybe some other competitors do. Uh, I do have is a um, a um, a kind of database um, selection guide, a decision guide about why we are different than other databases, uh, and you can go and see that from that standpoint, right? And then uh, finally, the big big things from from that point of view is that we really think about it is that you know it's always about ultimately is about business value. And so, you know, if you ever do as a business value and you always talk about, you know, we as engineers, we're just not just engineers too, right? We get the idea that we, it's not just technical benefits that get people to go use a product, right? You've got to make a business, you got to make a business case, right? Like what does user facing analytics provide for the end user, right? Right. Is this feature going to get more revenue for the company for our end user product? Is it going to give it more value to the end users of the system? Right. So there's de definitely that has to be a, a factor in play. The, the second thing here is that is is a cost optimal. Right. If there are some great things. There's this, this meme that's actually up on it. it, it it's talking about all the new AI uh, or or, or uh, chat GPT based companies that are like, how much money did I spend on on, on chat GPT? I, I spent 7 million. How much revenue do we get? 500K, right? Um, you know, just be just to say you get fast, it's great, but you want to be fast while making sure that it's cost efficient for you to go and get there, right? And being able to go and do that well it is, is very tough. And we talked about this. I was talking this uh, for for someone else. But if you look at, say, for instance, uh, Snowflake's um, cost model, they're 5x of the base VM. So you're basically paying 5x of this for the software that runs on top of the base. So if the VM costs $1, it's $5 for, for Snowflake. So it's $6 total, right? Now, obviously, uh, different use cases, different workload patterns. That's not always the same case, right? I'm just using a number generally speaking. But the thing is, is that, you know, are you going to get that value out of that $5, right? Can you find someone else, some other product in the marketplace, right? That also provides that similar value, but not at that, that, that cost model, right? And the last thing is technology benefits. Actually, technology benefits is probably the easiest one as engineers for us to justify, but it's really tough. And you guys all know, right? It, even if you select a new database, it takes time for you to train new people. It takes time for you to migrate the data. It takes time for you to build a new operational like playbook, right? All these type of things. It's not just saying, oh, okay, we can just switch a database every couple of years or even, you know, well, that's even um, being, being aggressive is every couple of years, right? Uh, you know, picking databases uh, uh, and switching it to, to uh, easily, right? So it's got to be one of those things that you want to be able to, to know that you're going to get real good value out of. So, um, you know, I talked about all these features and everybody, uh, you know, I always get reminded to the, like, kind of the, 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 the movie with, uh, uh, what's it called? Tom Cruise. And he goes, show me the money, show me the money. You have all these great features, but what does it mean? Right. It's like, you have a 500 horsepower car, but you only get like, 
like 200 horsepower at the wheels, right? What you care about is the horsepower at the wheels, not necessarily the horsepower in the engine itself, right? So this is what we, uh, we did some benchmarking from that standpoint. Uh, and you can kind of see the, the difference here uh, in terms of uh, versus ClickHouse and for Druid, right? And because uh, joins is not necessarily the strongest point for Druid, uh, and at the point when, when this was done with ClickHouse, uh, this is why we we picked is the Y table, the SSV, right? But if you switch to something like TPCDS, and if you look at the 99 queries, there's many, many more complex join queries in that. Then you look at situations like Trino, right? And so we have this like kind of 5.5x performance difference. Uh, one of the big major reasons here is because Trino itself doesn't have is a great cache mechanism, right? Uh, there's open GitHub issues uh, you uh, to go and enhance that feature, or you can actually even use a third-party product in order to to um, to get you uh, similar performance or better performance for for a Trino environment. So. Uh, so it, it's great to have studies, but what about real use cases from that standpoint? So this is one we, what we had for uh, for Airbnb. So this is one which they had a Presto environment and they were running uh, business dashboards and it took one to 10 minutes, right? Uh, this one is three tables, four joins. So the three tables, you're talking about billions of billions and millions four joins, three distinct counts, JSON functions, and regular expressions. So this used to take minutes to go done. And then it got, it got dropped all the way to about four seconds, right? So uh, this is a great uh, great talking about is that, you know, um, some of the complexities you go to, right? So before, you know, when, when you, so so why was Presto picked, right? So Presto was picked because the bill and Presto Strino was picked because the ability to go do joins, right? So the, the question becomes is like, why are we faster in all these different areas? So I talked a little bit about cash. That's one. The other major area is what I, what are the algorithms that are used for all the joins and for the way that we do uh, predicate pushdowns and filtering? Um, there's yet again a huge article online. You can go talk about it a little bit more about all the all the various differences. Uh, this one here is if you've ever played Battleground or you play with Riot Games, uh, they were actually using a combination of ClickHouse for real time analysis and Trino uh, uh, for um, ad hoc, and but they wanted to be able to have a single system that do it all. Plus they were actually using Apache Iceberg underneath, right? So here, uh, you know, we were able to go and do a single solution to replace the uh, ClickHouse for the real-time analysis and Trino for the ad hoc. And we're able to go do is some of the use cases that uh, was a little bit difficult uh, at the time, which was uh, real-time streaming updates. Um, so by using the primary key table, and by using the Kubernetes Elastic ability, they were able to go and get a lot of value uh, out of the system itself. So, um, so uh, there was a question also at the very beginning was a little bit about the relationship for Star Rocks and Stellar Data. Um, not sure if you know, but if you move your project to Linux Foundation, just like Apache, you can't call your your company that anymore. So, Star Rocks is the Linux Foundation project. Stellar Data is one of the big uh, organizations that contribute code to the Star Rocks project, right? Uh, Star, uh, seller Data uh, Cells is a uh, managed solution for, for Star Rocks. Uh, and there's a free developer tier if you want to go use it, 